I could be like the monk farmer and start doing some kind of a thing with this. That would be pretty impressive, huh? You're really trying to build colonies of microbes and it's a living soil that you're trying to build. So goats have crazy sharp back teeth. They're uh, serrated, kind of like a knife. So I've seen many, many people lose large parts of fingers back there. So this is celery, broccoli, and then there's leeks. What's your favorite thing we grow? Carrots. Carrots. Not strawberries? OK, strawberries. Ah, uh, I thought so. It amazes me how many times kids don't know that chicken actually comes from a live animal. This is Xenon tidbit. You know, the strawberries are definitely treated differently than the celery or the kales. They, everything gets its own little special cocktail. It's not like you can just open a book and it'll tell you exactly how to do it, but there are underlying principles of agronomy that if you understand them and apply them, over time you will have success and you never stop learning. And just when I think I know something, you realize you don't know everything and it's humbling. But that's also part of the satisfaction of it is that you're always mastering some other part and always tweaking your system. My name is David Bose and I'm an organic farmer. We uh, till the ground, make compost, spread compost, make beds, plant beds, take care of them, spray them, water them, harvest them, repeat. Yeah, I mean, the desert actually has some incredible advantages in some ways. Less rainfall, therefore greater control over access to the fields. Uh, we have more sunny days typically than most places. It's flat, <laughs> not the side of a mountain. Not that you can't grow a lot of great stuff on the side of a mountain. I would say that I came to understanding what I do know of agronomy later in the game. I started out just farming and I was fortunate enough to be farming on really good ground that was very forgiving. So I really didn't need to know exactly what was going on. It was only when I went into some very marginal ground that I really had to learn what the hell I was doing. We make our own compost, we buy materials, we'll compost that with our own green waste out of our own processing because we always have leaves and you know, when we take a cauliflower, we trim off those outer leaves. We try to save what doesn't end up in the field, ends up out of our packing shed, right in our compost piles. And then we have animals. And so all the straw and the manure that comes out of our own animals goes into our compost. And then after we make it, we're doing lab testing of the soil to know where we're at with each field. We'll add various forms of micronutrient like um, we'll add minerals, iron, zinc, manganese, and then we blend all that together and spread it very uniformly on the beds that we're going to grow in. So, you know, over the years I've read a little, but mostly it's applying principles, building the soil, not over applying, but applying enough materials and um, having a very keen eye to noticing when things are changing in a plant. You're really trying to build colonies of microbes and it's a living soil that you're trying to build. So broccoli harvest 101. Uh, probably people that have grown this in their backyard, they know this, but you can get multiple harvests off a broccoli plant. We come through with a big old knife and cut that center out, which was a big fat dome. And now the plant is producing all these little buds of little broccoli heads, but it's delicious. It actually is very sweet. And we'll sell that at the farmer's market and people that know, they're all over it. So we get more out of a plant because we have to. We can't, you know, so much food goes to waste you know, left on the plant, left in the field, because it's not the right size. But, you know, part of being small, we do whatever we can to get as much as we can get out of our plant. And then we'll mow it and recycle all those leaves. 
back into the soil, which is, we all go dust, dust to dust, ashes to ashes. Hey, you gotta go back, come on. I know, come on, sweet girl, good girl. Good girl, stay there. I don't think I've ever met an animal I don't like. All right, go, go. Thank you. I, from a very young age, have always loved all animals. I think there's a sense of peace that comes to you when you're out here with them. There's something about a goat that just instantly puts a smile on everybody's face. Just have to smile when you're around them. They're like the best class clown that there was. They can jump and they can twist and they can turn and they have the best ears. Their breath stinks though, but they've got a personality that won't quit. My name is Sarah Dolan and I am the general manager of Blue Sky Organic Farms. We are an organic farm. We grow on about 45 production acres. And this year we are growing approximately 90 different varieties of fruits and vegetables. We could easily produce enough produce on this farm to feed 20,000 people a week. The goats here, I mean, we breed goats and we sell goats. Uh, we do milk for personal consumption. Every year, it seems, we end up donating quite a bit of milk to uh, rescue organizations that are feeding litters of puppies or horses that have uh, lost their mothers. But we don't focus on milk production, really. We do send goats uh, all over the country. We sell them. Some of these guys are rescues that we took in and they're older and, or they're sassy. Some of the boys back here, they're neutered and we brought them in from bad situations. But everybody's loved, everybody has a name. People test me on that often. And then we have Gavin the Goose, who um, only hangs out with goats. He never hangs out with the birds out back. There's ducks and chickens. And he only eats with the goats. Thinks he is a goat. We're not a couple acre farm. You know, we're geared towards, I want to feed a lot of people. I want to feed school kids. I want to feed institutions. I, I want to feed veterans. I, I want to feed my neighbors and, you know, my friends and my kids' friends and their parents. And that's where you, I want to start. You know, I, I want it to be here for the next generation. And so much I fear that it won't be. You know, we do a lot of school tours here. And it amazes me how many times kids don't know that chicken actually comes from a live animal. Your chicken nuggets once walked around. Or that carrots grow under the ground and not on a tree. Or that you can milk a goat. A lot of people don't realize that you can get milk from anything besides a cow. Here at Blue Sky, that's our real mission, is to bring it to the whole community, not just you know the few people that want to drive out to our store or go to a farmer's market, but really bring it to people that can't do that too. I think it has to be studied more and understood more that the many beneficial effects of agriculture in an urban setting especially far outweigh just building more and more industry and residential housing. There are many problems that come with that all the citrus trees that used to be in this area, all of the melons that used to cover up the ground. A lot of food was grown here in the West Valley. And even in you know, the 14 years that I've been here on this farm, I have watched thousands and thousands of acres be taken out of agricultural production and be turned into development, whether it was housing or industrial of some sort. This property, 160 acres right here, surrounded by imminent development, and you can see all the large industrial tracks going on prime farm ground. Luke Air Force Base is not too far. That's probably why this property is still here, could be one of the reasons, and that is that 
the limitations of what you can build in the flight path of Luke. I mean, there's homes right there, but they don't fly over those homes. So this particular piece of property is probably in that flight plan. Maine, where I farmed, has preserved, I think they're up to 50,000 acres of farmland preserved. Pennsylvania, 800,000 acres of farmland, more than we have here total. They've preserved. That's not the totality of their farmland. That's the part of it that can never be built. And that's what lets young people know, or any people, that there's a future. Okay, so these are transplanted romaine lettuces, and they're looking nice. They look like they're liking the weather, and uh, they will be ready in about four weeks. They'll just explode into some big romaine plants. These are, these are butter lettuces. I ran into some trouble with my butter lettuces after the rain. They're pretty sensitive. As you can see, this is how I do it. This is not a lot of lettuce, but this is a block right here that went in. And then two weeks later, you can see the size difference here. Two weeks later, I transplanted another group and then another group. Getting these successive blocks gives me a continuous supply, and that's what I need. Continuous supply in order to feed all the hungry people that come to the farmer's market. As farmers, you are always very conscious of all your resources and you do your very best to conserve everything. And water being foremost there, you know, you don't want to water too much because you don't want it to be too muddy when you have to go back in and harvest. Water can leach nutrients from the soil. So, you know, we err on the side of just what do you need. So a large part of our workforce is H-2A labor. It's a visa program through the government, the United States government. They voluntarily go, they get matched with us as a farm. We pay their travel expenses, they come here, we pay to house them, and they agree to a, a contract that's no more than nine months for us. I mean, a lot of these people work for 14, 15, 16 dollars a day from where they're from. We pay them more than 14 dollars an hour here. It's hard work. They've given up a lot to come here and we absolutely realize that. But without them, we would not have any labor. You have to have a passion for it. And I find a lot of local people here aren't willing to do that. I have all the respect in the world for what they give us. Currently we have baby tomatoes and some basil growing. We do have a heater in here for when it gets really cold at night. The sides on this house uh, go up and down so we can adjust the temperature. Or if it's super windy, we don't want them to get wind burnt or anything like that. So. And then we have these structures so that as the plants grow, we can trellis them up so that they're not all falling over onto each other. It also makes it a whole lot easier for picking. And we pick them every day. And uh, so they're dead ripe when we pick them and they go straight to the store or the markets. A lot of times you'll see things that get picked before they're perfectly ripe so that they ripen in transportation. But we wait till they're exactly ripe on the vine. It's got the best flavor, I feel like. Brussels sprouts are right here. Everybody's favorite. If you've never had a Brussels sprout, you should try it again. And we actually harvest sprout by sprout as they become ready. We actually cut almost everything um, on the farm by hand. So every bunch of greens is done by hand. Instead of taking like the whole plant, like when you bunch greens, we do the same exact thing. We take it leaf by leaf. And so we can get several months of harvest off one plant. So we do sprinkler irrigation over here, and this also allows us to put out any fertilizers or nutrients the plants need at the time. You know, the strawberries are definitely treated differently than the celery or the kales. They, everything gets its own little special cocktail. We are certified organic. We've always been certified organic. Which means that we have a third party audit us, and we adhere to a rather stringent, strict set of rules and guidelines for how to produce organic food. Organic is not using synthetic pesticides, fertilizers. Organic is always non-GMO, so we don't ever use anything genetically modified. Organic is truly tending to the land and being respectful that everything starts for a plant with the health of the soil and treating it as its true living, breathing being that it is. But I would 
put a, any organic farm up against a conventional farm for productivity once you establish that base. Once you get it up and going and it's strong and balanced, I would say that you're going to produce more nutritional, better tasting, and stronger plants and not need as much, you know, maybe insecticide and those sort of things because your plants are very strong. Cauliflower, that'll show up sometime in April. But you can see their organic um, insecticides are not really powerful enough to kill an aphid that's deep inside. So as the, as the head, the leaves wrap and the head forms inside, <laughs> it's like a perfect little safe haven for aphids. These are new plantings of onions. They're all going to be various types of bunching onions and then carrots. This is kohlrabi. We don't grow a ton of it, but it's a beautiful plant. And you can see it makes a ball that's still very small. It'll make a ball this big and it's really crunchy and juicy. It's sort of like reminiscent of jicama and beet. Not everybody knows about them, but people that love them, love them. And they're beautiful. This striking the leaf and you could probably eat the leaves and everything. French breakfast radish. I suppose the French named it. I don't know that I've ever had a radish for breakfast. So good. Mmm, yummy. I love this part of my life so much. It's every day is different and it's always a challenge and there's always something that is so frustrating. But at the end of the day, you go home and you know that you did something really worthwhile for your community. And I love raising my kids here. You know, my kids, they get to see goats born and they get to see things harvested. And I think it gives everybody a real sense of purpose after spending a full day here and working. I always have loved to cook since I was a little boy, helping my mom and a little later, I decided to really get serious about cooking. So it's for me just, uh, it's all part of the same thing, growing it, cooking it, eating it, consuming it. It's all part of the cycle of life that I get a lot of meaning from being a part of. So in here are the cherry tomatoes. You can see they grow in clusters like this. And again, we don't pick them until they're absolutely ripe. There's a lot of mosaic viruses actually, cucumber, watermelon, alfalfa. But the tobacco mosaic virus, especially in a protected environment, can wipe you out really fast because a lot of the air is recycled and it particularly it likes to attack tomatoes. We are a tobacco-free farm and we always ask before anybody comes into the greenhouse if you are a smoker and if you are, we ask you to sanitize or a lot of times we don't even allow you in here. So this is the end result of all the growing and strawberries picked this morning cabbage, peas, cucumbers, everything from the fields. And we also sell a variety of local uh, organic citrus from Justice Brothers. We are all about supporting other local farms and building a community of farms. Uh, salad mix, spinach, arugula. The salad uh, gets cut in the morning and it gets processed and wash, so we have a triple wash system here, a uh, whole salad processing plant out back. And it'll be washed within a couple of hours and packed. And this is it, best salad mix in town. Packaged Russell sprouts that we just picked out in the field. Take them home, feed them my kids for dinner tonight. For food security overall, and I'm a big believer that every region should produce as much food as they can. We have to break through some of those stereotypes about what a farmer is, what farming is, educate people to the incredibly beneficial thing that it is, and what a great career it is, and what a noble profession. I think we're a dying breed, it appears, in this part of the country especially. The average farmer in countries about my age. You can't take farmland and develop on it and then expect someday for it to come back into production. Once you pave over it and you kill the microbial life that's in the soil underneath, you, you don't reclaim that. You don't get to take up the tar or the concrete later. 
and just expect to throw some seeds in the ground and that it's gonna grow. I mean, anybody can grow one single tomato plant on your porch. You could grow a pot of strawberries on your balcony. Uh, you could have a raised bed garden that could, you know, feed your family most of the year on a very small footprint. I think anybody could do parts of this at home pretty easily. I think it's really important to know where your food comes from and to have that connection to it. We tend to think that it will all just appear for us from some community, whether that community is within this state, within the country, or somewhere in the world. And so we don't have that connection ourselves to understand how important that is to get your food as fresh as possible. And that it really is the primary health care in your life is what you consume. And if you consume healthy food and with awareness, that probably will keep you well for most of your life. And that is not taught. From my field crews who I bring in from Mexico and they leave their families behind and they come here and they give it everything they've got. And everybody who works administratively here, you know, it's almost all their second careers. And they came here because they have a love of food and they have a love of farming and what we do. And you couldn't ask for a better group of people. I love to come here every day for those people. It really is about giving back and whether that's giving back to the ground or giving back to the people, but animals play such a big part of that. I mean, they've given everything they have to us and it's only right that we give back to them in any way. And if that means that a goat is born and only three of her legs are good, she gets to stay here forever and have a great life, lay in the sun, and that's what it's all about, you know? I continue to do it now with the hope that somehow I can pass it on. I do it in hopes that it goes beyond me. It's not just about me. It's about my community. It's about the future.